So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Tracy. I'm a reference librarian here at Mentor Public Library, and I want to welcome you and thank you for coming today. I'm also a graduate student at Indiana University's online history master's program. Today, we're going to learn about the queen consort, Alexandra. She was the longest ever princess of Wales. She was on as Princess of Wales for 38 years, and she was extremely popular. She often takes a back seat now with historians and royal enthusiasts, but she really was comparable to Princess Diana in a number of ways, um, including popularity. She is also Queen Elizabeth II's great-grandmother. Alexandra was part of the Danish royal family, and she was not rich in royalty. Considered by royal standards, they were middle class. And she was born on December 1st, 1844, at Yellow Palace in Copenhagen. She was nicknamed Alex, and she was not expected to have such a high standing. In fact, her father was not expected to succeed the throne at all. He was eventually chosen to succeed his childless uncle. So her father eventually would be Christian IX. This change in the line of succession did not change their financial status. It was a very close family. So her father, as we just said, was Christian IX. He was chosen to become successor to the King of Denmark in 1852, he also led his country through the Second Schleswig War, and he was known as the father-in-law of Europe. That was because his daughters made very good marriages. His wife was Louise of Hesse Castle, and she was actually more royal than he was, but she was a woman, so that could be part of the reason they chose her husband to succeed his uncle. They were part of the House of Glucksburg. That is the house of the Danish royal family still today. So Alexandra had five siblings. Uh, her brother would go on to be Frederick VIII of Denmark. The brother she was actually closest to was George I. His birth name was William but he was chosen, just like his father, to be uh, king of Greece. And he actually was chosen because there was a vacancy on the throne. She was closest to her sister Dagmar, and Dagmar married into the Russian royal family. And she was rechristened and became Marie Feodorovna of Russia. Thyra uh, was the crown princess of Hanover, in her latter days, and her youngest brother, Prince Valdemar, turned down the throne of Bulgaria. He ended up marrying a French woman and living in Paris. Alexandra was educated at home with her sister Marie. They actually shared a room and teachers. Alex learned to sew her own clothes, including socks. She learned foreign languages. She actually learned English. So when she joined the British royal family, it wasn't a struggle. She already knew the language. Her parents focused a lot on mu music and religion. She was confirmed at Christian Borg Palace in Copenhagen. They didn't focus so much on writing and math. In fact, her grammar is a mess. In her letters, there is little to no grammar or punctuation at all. The family knew Hans Christian Andersen, and he actually read them uh, stories when they were children. She was also a dancer and gymnast. She would entertain her guests with her gymnastics moves. So her first meeting with Albert Edward, known as Bertie to his family and the Prince of Wales, was at Speyer Cathedral in Germany. And they met on September 24th, 1861. They were actually set up by Albert Edwards' sister, Victoria. 
and he was originally there to observe the country's military. Alexandra was invited as well. Queen Victoria and Prince Albert originally were unsure of the Danish royal monarchy. They originally wanted a German princess, but nobody was found. There was no suitable German bride. So they started to look at the Danish royal family. They saw a picture of Alexandra. She was very pretty looking, and they decided to schedule a meeting. Well, the meeting went very well. They were not in love by any means. They had just met. But in those days, they, after a meeting went well, they started marriage negotiations. After the meeting, unfortunately, there was a scandal. Albert Edward was known as the Playboy Prince. He was not very uh, faithful in his future marriage, but the problems arise even before an engagement. So the year he met Alexandra, he engaged in a relationship with his 10 weeks at Cura Camp with the Grenadier Guards with a woman named Nellie Clifton. She was an Irish actress and he would be with her again in September when he was at Cambridge and that meeting was arranged by Charles Carrington, a friend and politician. The Queen and Prince Consort were absolutely horrified by their son's behavior. And Prince Albert loses faith in his son. Um, eventually, he was a little more forgiving about it, but he is uh, very upset about it, reasonably so. And he writes a letter to his son at Cambridge University saying, I am coming to see you. He did not explain why. And when he got there, they go on a walk and they talk about it and what this means to the family's reputation. And unfortunately, it's tragic that Prince Albert only lives a couple months afterward. He dies in December of that year. And Victoria is grief stricken. Her husband was only in his 40s and she was devastated and blames Bertie, her son, for killing her husband, essentially. She said, your dreadful business killed him. And it was believed to be typhoid at the time and his affair with Nellie Clifton ended after that. So the Prince of Wales decides to do what um, his father would want him to do, and he proposes to Alexandra at Lacken Palace in Belgium at his great uncle Leopold I's palace on the 9th of September, 1862. Victoria does go to the palace. She meets Alexandra and she's wearing black because she's still in mourning. It was not a love match, but they are accepting of these, uh, the circumstances. Even after the engagement, immediately after Alexandra would go with Victoria to see what life would be like in the British royal family and what she would be responsible for. And Bertie was taken on a cruise of the Mediterranean with the crown prince and princess of Prussia, his sister Vicky and her husband Fritz. So they really had no time together after the engagement to get to know each other. She arrived in England three days before the wedding. And there are large crowds at the port in Kent where she arrives and she is joined by her husband, the Prince of Wales and they go on a royal train to London, and in London they're greeted by Queen Victoria. It's very exciting to the people to meet their new princess, and Alfred Lord Tennyson composed a poem to memorialize the event. Sea King's daughter from over the sea, Alexandra, Saxon and Norman and Dane are we. 
put all of us Danes in our welcome of thee, Alexandra. They were married on March 10th, 1863 at Windsor Castle at St. George's Chapel. It's a very unusual venue for a wedding in those days. First of all, it's hard to get to. It's outside of London and it's very small and it's hard to view. People uh, that wanted to be spectators wouldn't easily be able to get there to see it. To much of Alexandra's family's disappointment, only the immediate family was actually invited to watch her get married. Before the event, Victoria, the Prince of Wales, and Alexandra went to Frogmore Mall Museum to visit Prince Albert with Victoria. They had just created a monument for him. There was a carriage procession. First come the Danes, then the Brits, the Prince of Wales, and finally the bride. Victoria was in mourning clothes, as she usually was, and escorted by her brother-in-law, Ernest, the Duke of Saxe, Coburg, and Gotha, and viewed in her own closet. She watched the wedding alone in her special private area. The wedding was done by the Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Longley. There were eight bridesmaids, and she was supported by her father and the Duke of Cambridge. The Prince of Wales was supported by the Duke of saxe coburg and Gotha, and Fritz, the Crown Prince of Prussia. After the wedding, they went back to Windsor Castle. There were lots of witnesses. The Danish and British ministers were there, and so was the Lord Chancellor. They all signed to the marriage register. There was a banquet for the royal guests in the state dining room. And Alexandra was from this moment on known as the HRH Princess of Wales. Her dress was done by Mrs. James of Belgravia. It's now in the royal collection. It featured in a museum event a couple years ago. She was actually the first member of the royal family to be photographed while wearing her wedding dress. It was made of white silk, satin, myrtle, orange blossoms, toll puffs, and honiton lace. There was a silver train of 21 feet long, carried by girls 15 to 20 years old. She had a lace veil and train trimming and her own handkerchief. The lace had cornucopias, which is the flower of India, English roses, Irish shamrocks, and Scottish thistles. There was a wreath of blossoms and myrtle. Her bouquet uh, was, had orange blossoms, rosebuds, lily, orchids, and myrtle. She also had a pearl necklace and earrings, uh, opal and diamond bracelet. Their honeymoon was spent at Queen Victoria's favorite house, Osborne House, on the Isle of Wight. Alexandra and the Prince of Wales both loved to entertain and have guests, be around people. And she got along very well with her mother-in-law, Victoria. Alexandra would be a person Victoria could lean on in years, and they got along reasonably well even though they had very different personalities. Queen Victoria almost never went out after her husband's untimely death, and she really didn't do most of the duties that Alexandra would do. She was often holed up in the palace, and the people really craved attention from the monarchy. They wanted to get to know their monarch and Queen Victoria only went out to do ceremonial duties. So they were really looking for someone to bridge that gap. Victoria once said, to spare me the strain and fatigue of functions, she opens bazaars, attends concerts, visits hospitals in my place. She not only never complains, but endeavors to prove that she has enjoyed what to another would be a tiresome duty. So the royal family is finally going out and meeting the people. Alexandra had two homes 
Sandringham and Marlborough. Uh, Marlborough is in London and Sandringham in Norfolk. And Sandringham would be a special place for the remainder of her life. Alexandra had a number of hobbies, uh, riding, especially horses. She also liked driving tandem, which was driving in a carriage with two horses, each one in front of the other. She loved photography. She would eventually auction off an album of photographs that she created herself for charity. She liked ice skating and hunting, much to Victoria's dismay. Queen Victoria tried and tried to get Alexandra to stop hunting, which she could not do. 1864 was a really big year for Alexandra's Danish family. And her father became king of Denmark. And her sister Dagmar became engaged to Nicholas Alexandrovich. He was the heir to the throne of Russia. Her brother William became King George I of Greece. And she gave birth to her first child, Albert Victor, January 8th, 1864. He was premature because Alexandra had gone ice skating and went into labor. So he had some mental difficulties, but for now he's in the path to become king one day. As a result of her father being on the throne and in, to some eyes, breaking the London Protocol on February 1st, 1864, the Second Schleswig uh, War begins. And so the German Confederation invaded Denmark and they actually reduced it by two-fifths. Alex and Albert Edward supported Denmark, of course, with her native homeland. And Alex would never forgive the Prussian, uh, the Germans, and the Austrians for taking some of her land and causing her home country a lot of pain. Queen Victoria supported the Prussian side, as did the crown prince and princess of Prussia. Their second son was born on June 3rd, 1865. Prince George, destined for a career in the Royal Navy as the second son. He was close in age with Albert Victor, who is also known as Eddie to the family. His, their sister Louise was born on February 20th, 1867. She becomes the Princess Royal as she is the oldest of the three girls. She is quiet and shy and described as withdrawn. She becomes the Duchess of Fife by marrying Alexander Duff. He is the Earl of Fife and they live in Scotland for most of their adult lives. So sadly, the labor and delivery with Louise is not as smooth as someone would want it. Alexandra gets diagnosed with rheumatic fever and this would leave her with a permanent limp and it impaired her hearing, which she already inherited from her father, autosclerosis, which she would get progressively more deaf throughout her life. It took her four years to walk again without walking sticks, and she had inflammation in her knee. And uh, because she was so loved and so popular, masses began imitating her limp. So at parties, people would start limping to be like the Princess of Wales. And they also were inspired by her fashion. Alexandra often wore choker necklaces because she wanted to cover up a scar from her childhood, but people loved it and they started wearing more and more choker necklaces. She almost died and it causes a bit of a rift between her and her husband because he was not really around while she was sick. He was absent, he was running around with other women and also gambling. Her first, fourth child, Victoria, was born on July 6th, 1868. She would be known to the family as Toria, and she would be extremely close to her mother and brother George. Alex 
uh, was able to handle some of the affairs because Toria was so close to her and her companion. Toria would never marry, and she was very lively, smart, and funny. In 1968 to 69, the Prince and Princess of Wales embarked on a six-month tour to Austria, Egypt, Greece, and Turkey. They saw the Crimean battlefields, they met the Khedive Ismail of Egypt, and Alex was the first woman to have dinner with the Sultan Abdulaziz of Turkey, the Ottoman Empire at the time. She made several trips abroad throughout her life. She really enjoyed traveling until she was too ill to do it anymore. And she would often go to Denmark at least once or twice a year to visit her home family. And uh, they would actually have reunions for the entire family in Denmark. And Victoria would wonder why she would go. She's with us now, she's part of us. Why is she going to visit her family in Denmark? Princess Maud was born on the 26th of November, 1869, and she was a bit of a tomboy. She was called Harry, after Henry Keppel, the hero of the Crimean War. She eventually married Prince Carl of Denmark, and when Norway got their independence from Sweden, they needed a monarch. And Prince Carl becomes Hakon. He and Maud become the king and queen of Norway in 1905. Tragically, their sixth and final child, Alexander John, only lived around a day. It was devastating for both of them. Alexandra never got over it. And she would remark that there's nothing really to remember him by. His life was so short that we don't have anything in our house that really is, we're able to look at and remember him with. People were not really sympathetic to the couple, especially the newspapers. They had a private funeral and he was buried on the Sangringham estate away from the public. Over the years, the Prince of Wales, and when he was king, had many different scandals. And he had over upwards of 50 mistresses. The first scandal he was involved at was the Baccarat scandal. And that was when he was at a party, he was bored, he wanted to gamble. So he and his friends started Baccarat, a game that was illegal and a card game often played for money. And one of the players was convinced that another player was cheating and actually sued him in court. And Albert Edward was called as a witness. The Lady Mordaunt divorce case came out when Lady Mordaunt gave birth to a blind daughter. Well, her husband, Lord Mordaunt said, that can't possibly be my child. So he assumed she had adultery, which she confessed to during the divorce case. She confessed to cheating with a couple of different men and the Prince of Wales was named. Another time, Bertie had to appear in court as a witness and Alexandra couldn't ignore these cases. Uh, Lord Randolph Churchill, his brother, the Marquess Blanford, eloped with Lady Alsbury, obviously married to Lord Alsbury, while her husband was on a boy's trip in India. The letters reached Lord Alsbury, and he actually had to leave early. Well, the Prince of Wales was the one doing the trip, and he was absolutely furious. And Lord Randolph thought that, well, this is very ironic and hypocritical of you. You're the one having all the affairs and you get mad at somebody else. So he threatened to publish letters between Lady Alsbury and Bertie. And Albert Edward actually challenged Lord Randolph Churchill to a duel. He said no, but uh, Albert Edward personally, permanently lost the friendships which was very upsetting to Lady Randolph Churchill. She really prized 
herself on having that connection with the royal family. So let's talk a little bit about the boys' trip. In 1878, uh, the Prince of Wales was to go on an eight-month tour of India. He was going to see Malta and Greece, and he made it a boys' trip, though usually the Prince of Wales traditionally, if he has a wife, takes his wife on these types of diplomatic trips. Alexandra was left behind, and she was angry and hurt about it. She really never completely forgot about this. She might forgive, but not forget. And the tour was a success. He was said to have treated everyone of all social classes equally. The Prince of Wales soon after contracted typhoid fever, which as they all thought at that point, uh, his father died of. He contacted it while staying at Lonsborough Hotel Lodge in North Yorkshire. And Lonsborough was an NP and friend at the time. So the nation goes into absolute panic. The Prince of Wales is sick. He's almost on his deathbed. What is going to happen to the monarchy? A friend of the Prince of Wales almost died. And it brought back a good relationship with his uh, wife and also his mother. Because you don't realize what you have until it's almost gone. Alexandra was very concerned. After his recovery, uh, his popularity was boosted. He had not been popular before. In fact, Alexandra was the most popular member of the royal family at the time. Uh, she was cheered everywhere she went. But occasionally, the Prince of Wales was actually booed at his events, especially when, with his scandalous behavior, being in the news often. So in 1878, the Russo-Turkish War, conflict in the Ottoman Empire breaks out against the Russian Empire, who is siding with Bulgaria, Romania, and Serbia. Alex, of course, is pro-Russia, and she wants a revision of borders between Greece and Turkey. Alex would often give her political views to the family, and it was almost always ignored, but she gave her unsolicited input anyway. In 1879, Eddie and George were to go on a three-year cruise around the world. Alexandra was very distraught. She had the inability to see her children grow up. They were teenagers, and they were about to embark on a journey that would change their lives. They were with their tutor, John Dalton, so they were with a responsible uh, person while being there, and it was for their naval training. But she cried and cried at the port, saying goodbye to them as they went on their trip. They did write to her regularly, and she wrote back to them. The 1880s were very eventful in this family, especially uh, Alexandra's Danish family. So Marie of Russia, her father-in-law, was assassinated. He was Alexander II. It was very brutal and it was very traumatic for the royal family. Marie and her husband Alexander, if you remember earlier we talked about that she was engaged to a man named Nicholas. He tragically passed away possibly of meningitis years earlier and on his deathbed, he asked his younger brother, Alexander, known as Sasha, to marry his fiance, which they did. It was a very happy and successful marriage. So Marie and Alexander were coronated at the Assumption Cathedral in Moscow. And Alex and Edward were there. They came uh, for Alexander II's funeral and stayed for several weeks, including the coronation. The Kokoshin tiara up there, Alexandra loved so much, she had one made for herself. Her brother George celebrated 25 years on the throne of Greece, and Alexandra was a guest at several events for his Silver Jubilee in Greece. She was at balls, parades, 
and a Thanksgiving service. Her youngest brother, Valdemar, married, he married Princess Marie de Orleans in 1885 in Paris. Tragically, royal families aren't immune to pandemics. And in 1892, um, a pandemic hit England and around the world, actually. And Eddie came down with it soon after Christmas. He, at the time, he was engaged to Mary of Tech. He was in love with a woman named Aline de Orleans, uh, but Victoria, as queen, had to approve the marriage. She vetoed it due to the fact that there could not be a Roman Catholic bride in the family, had to be an Anglican spouse. So they could not marry due to religious differences, and he was engaged to Mary of Tech. He died on January 14th at the age of 28. Alexandra uh, could not deal with this death. It hit her very hard. And she left his room as a shrine, and that room would stay a shrine for many years to come. His funeral was a week later. George and Mary became very close after the death of Eddie, and George proposed to Mary, nicknamed May, due to the month of her birth in 1893 in his sister Louise's backyard garden, where they were both invited for tea. And they were married on the 6th of July, 1893. They were married in the Royal Chapel at St. James's Palace, and they lived at York Cottage, which suited them until it was too cramped when they had six children, and it was a small house on the Sangringham Estate. It was a love match. George would never take a mistress. At the wedding, Mary wore a dress that had rose, shamrock, thistle, orange blossoms, and it was silk. It was the Art Nouveau style. She was the daughter of the Duke and Duchess of Tech, and Alexandra wore her kakashink tiara to the wedding. She is pictured there with her mother and daughter, Louise. Alexandra would get along well with Mary. They were friendly and cordial, but they were not the best of friends. They had very different personalities. In total, Alexandra and Bertie would have a total of 10 grandchildren. Through George and May, they had David, Bertie, Mary, Henry, George, and Johnny. Through Louise, they had Alastair, who unfortunately died in infancy, Alexandra and Maud, and Maud had a son named Olaf. They took care of their children when the parents were on tour. George and May went on many month, several month long trips early on in their marriage, and Alexandra and Bertie doted on the grandchildren. Victoria died in 1901 on the 22nd of January in, at Osborne House. She was buried in February and it was a royal affair. It really was uh, incredible that tons of royals from all over Europe turned out for this funeral. The Prince of Wales became Edward VII. He was at her bedside and had waited decades for this moment. They were to be coronated at Westminster Abbey, and their duties didn't change much. They already did a, quite a bit of charity work and royal duties as it was. The only thing that changed for Edward was now that he had official correspondence to do and to open red boxes every day. Victoria did not let him in on royal affairs very often, so he was getting used to that because he had never done it before. And he kept Alexandra mainly out of official business. Alexandra kept most of her staff when she was Princess of Wales, and that included Charlotte Knowles, her Lady of the Bedchamber, who actually early on in the reign would save her from a bedroom fire at Sangringham. Unfortunately, the coronation had to be postponed. The king 
in early 1902 gets appendicitis and to prevent panic Alexandra goes to attend the Royal Ascot and military parades. The King had the operation at London Hospital and on August 9th they were crowned two months after the scheduled date. It was a carefully planned keeping the empire in mind and it was also religious. The newspapers remarked that the king looked worn and pale and used a cane throughout the ceremony. And after the uh, coronation, 70 guests were taken to dinner where the king and queen hosted. Alexandra's dress was done by Lady Curzon, wife of the Viceroy of India. She had floral emblems of England, Scotland, and Ireland on it the Tudor rose, thistle, and shamrock. Her gown was made of gold net with metallic embroidery. And the Lady Curzon actually had a similar gown made for herself when she was going to be in India. And she wore it over there. And it took four months to make this dress with the final alterations. And it was made by House of Fort Worth in Paris. It was customary for uh, the consort to wear a coronet during the ceremony, which she did. When she was not wearing the coronet, uh, she wore the George IV tiara. After the ceremony, they made a balcony appearance at the top of Buckingham Palace. Her charity work was very notable. She had funds of hers launched the HMS Alexandra that ferried the wounded back from the Sudan during the Modest War. She also had a hospital ship named the Princess of Wales that brought back the wounded from the Boer War. She often visited the London Hospital where she met the Elephant Man, also known as Joseph Merrick, who's a man that was very disfigured, probably had to uh, developmental abnormalities. He was put in freak shows and in circuses for a period of time. In Belgium, his circus abandoned him and he was taken back to London where he was put in the London Hospital. Alexandra became very good friends with him and she also founded the Imperial Military Nursing Service. And when she got the royal warrant, it became Queen Alexandra's Royal Army Nursing Corps, and it was founded with its own royal warrant. So it was all her personal charity. She would give money to anyone who needed it. Numerous people asked her for money for their various charities, and she would have a check in the mail the next day, whether no questions asked, she did not ask them what it was for, or anything about it at all. Some family members and uh, royal courtiers were worried that because she didn't ask any questions, they may not be legitimate. Uh, but every time someone asked her questions about what she was donating for or do donating to, she would raise her hand and just walk out of the room. It really was the changing of generations when she became queen. Her mother died in 1898. Victoria in 1901 and her father in 1905. In 1906, she and Marie, her sister, bought a vacation home north of Copenhagen in Kloppenburg. Her brother became Frederick VIII of Denmark and they would go to Denmark often to visit the family and go to their vacation home, often taking her children. She loved Denmark and she was always proud to go there and support her people. So on the death of Edward VII happened in 1910. She went to Corfu to visit her brother, George I. And when she got there, she found out her husband was seriously ill. She had to go back home and she arrived around 24 hours before he died. She personally administered oxygen in a glass cylinder for him. Unfortunately, his death 
was not drama free as his life was also not drama free. His mistress, Alice Keppel, came to the palace asking to see Edward um, on his deathbed. Uh, she had a letter in hand uh, from him saying that if he were to die, he would like her to be there. So Alexandra graciously lets her see Edward. And unfortunately, the woman starts crying hysterically and screaming. And she tried to be discreet, but she really, like, practically in the hallway falls over. And all over, you know, Alexandra just has had enough after this scene. She says, get that woman away. And so they escort the woman from the palace, who coincidentally happens to be Camilla Parker Bowles' great-grandmother. <laughs> Alexandra says, I feel as if I had been turned into stone, unable to cry, unable to grasp the meaning of it all. She just was so overwhelmed by the death and everything that had gone on in her life at that moment. She was the first woman to visit the House of Commons and sit in on a bill. She sat for two hours in the ladies' gallery, and the bill wanted to remove the rights of the House of Lords to veto legislation. She did not say whether she was for or against the bill to them, but we know now that she was against the bill. After her son became George V and her daughter-in-law, Queen Mary, she tried to be supportive, especially early on when he was learning how to be king and really had a lot of obstacles going on in Parliament. But she also did not want to leave her home. She wanted to stay in Sangriam, which was not traditional. Usually the Queen Mother uh, moves out and lets her children have the bigger homes now that they're king and queen. She also did not attend uh, her son's coronation. It was not customary for the Queen Mother to do so. She began a charity called Alexandra Rose Day, and that was when artificial roses made by people with disabilities are sold to aid hospitals and other charities. She often also auctioned off a photography album for Christmas that raised funds for her various charities. Sadly, early on in her time as Queen Mother in 1913, her brother, George I, was assassinated in Thessaloniki. When World War I broke out, she had been distrustful of Wilhelm II for a long time. And people were beginning to notice that the royal family seemed uh, very German. First of all, their house name is Saxe Coburg and Gotha, very Germanic. And there's still the Order of the Garter banners being displayed of foreign princes. And there are an amazing number of how many of those have German names. And people are saying, is our royal family really British or are they German? So Alexandra supported um, getting down the German banners. She told her son, get down those dreadful banners. He got down all the banners, but my Hessian banners, she said, they're under orders. He had to get down all of them. On the 17th of September, 1916, Sangringham endured a Zeppelin air raid. And Alexandra was at Sangringham. That was the closest she got to action in World War I. Unfortunately, her Russian relatives did not fare very well at all. Her nephew, Nicholas II, had to abdicate in 1917. His wife, himself, and their children were assassinated by firing squad in 1918, and Alexandra was deeply upset. The poor children, she cried. She eventually, after a year of trying, got her sister Marie to leave Russia. She went with her daughter Xenia and some of her children and their dogs. 
they left on the battleship Marlboro, and they changed in Malta to the battleship Lord Nelson. Marie got back to, to London and stayed with Alexandra. They shared a home. Eventually, Marie decided that England wasn't for her, and she decided to move home to her native Denmark. Tragically, Prince John, the youngest of George and May's children, Alexandra's, young, one of her youngest grandchilds, passed away. And he was epileptic and possibly autistic. Alexandra visited him often. They were both on the Sandringham estate. Johnny was at Wood Farm and she was at the big house. Johnny had been out of the public eye for some time. Alexandra, because she felt that Johnny needed things to do. He had some local children to play with, but his life still needed some purpose. She had a garden that she made for him, and he was able to maintain it. Um, and he really enjoyed the garden. But unfortunately, he had a severe seizure in January of 1919, and he passed away with his nanny, Lala Bill, at his side. In Alex's condolence letter to May, she said, now our two darling Johnnies lie side by side. Alexandra looked youthful until about the First World War, and she was unable to travel after the war. So World War I really marked the end of her youth. Uh, she was deaf, and her blood vessels in her eye burst in 1920, leading to partial blindness. She wore heavy makeup, and she had memory and speech issues. Her main joy was her dogs, especially the Pekingese, and Toria was also a joy to her. And, but Toria had become more independent as she got older. So she spent the majority of her time with Charlotte Knowles at the big house in Sandringham, isolated. The day before her death, she suffered a seizure and died on the November the 20th, 1925 at Sandringham. She died around 11 a.m. Most of her family was by her side. The Prince of Wales and the Duke of York were late. Flags flew at half mast, shows, music, dances were canceled, and Stanley Baldwin, the Prime Minister, made a motion of condolence. The Marquess of Salisbury had a great quote about her that really summed up uh, what her personality was like. She had beauty and dignity. She had an exquisite manner and unfailing consideration. She had a winning friendliness for all whom she came in contact. In a word, her charm was irresistible to both those who knew her well and those who knew her the least. She lied for a few days at St. Mary Magdalene Church, and then she was moved to the Chapel Royale at the St. James Palace. There was a simple service, and her coffin was draped in her banner of arms. Several mourners followed the coffin in the procession, and many villagers joined in. In London, they had a procession from St. James's to Westminster Abbey. The route was lined by the military. There were several different regiments that took part of the procession and had their own individual gun salutes. The procession was attended by the king, the kings of Belgium, Denmark, and Norway, and the crown princes of Norway, Sweden, and Romania. There was the Prince of Wales, Louis Mountbatten, and Prince Valdemar of Denmark. The Queen of Spain, the Queen of Norway, and Queen Mary all went straight to the Abbey. At Westminster Abbey, the funeral was on the 27th of November at 11.30 a.m. They sang Psalm 23 and hymns on resurrection morning. The coffin was watched by the honorable corps of the gentlemen at arms and the yeomen of the guard. She was laid in the abbey and the public mourned. There were people crying in the streets. 
during the procession. The Australian government held mourning services and she in 1927 was placed beside her husband in the tomb when it was finally finished. It had not been finished before her death. She originally was in the royal vault at Windsor and the burial depicts the king and queen lying side by side with the king's favorite dog Caesar at his feet. Her legacy includes many charities uh, the royal family now interacting with the people on an almost daily basis and she had two great granddaughters named after her one being Elizabeth Alexandra Mary of York and the future Queen Elizabeth II who was born only a couple months after her great-grandmother's death there was also the Princess Alexandra, the Honorable Lady Ogilvie, uh, who made a Buckingham Palace appearance um, on the balcony at Charles III's coronation. And we also have uh, pictures of the Norwegian and Danish royal families. Through her daughter Maud, the Norwegian royal family is still on the throne today. We have Harold V and his wife Sandra, Hakon and his wife met Merritt and we have a balcony picture of the Danish royal family at Amalienburg Palace in Copenhagen. We have in the center Queen Margrethe and she advocated earlier this year announcing her abdication in her New Year's message of 2023 which shocked all royal watchers and she had reigned for 52 years before giving the throne up to her son Frederick X and his wife Queen Mary and there they are standing with their children. Alexandra was a very interesting woman during her time who often takes a back seat but she is just as important to learn about and I hope you enjoyed the presentation and if you have any questions, feel free to always ask. Yeah.